you hear that? Susie said to her husband, who was dead asleep. He didn't answer. She shook him again, hoping she didn't have to be surrounded in the darkness alone. Still no answer, not even a grunt of anger. There was a buzzing sound. The dreaded noise annoyed her every day this week. Why was she the only one who could hear it? She didn't have a clue. Taking the blankets off, she decided to listen for the sound to see where it was coming from. Slowly down the hall, trying not to make a peep, she glided gently along the walls in the dark. Miss Susie, a man's voice said in a low calm tone. Susie came to a complete stop. Her heart beat faster as she sensed someone in front of her. It was like a slow cool breeze, but she couldn't make out any solid objects. Squinting, she still couldn't see if anyone was in front of her. The breeze still came towards her. She could feel her body shiver with each hit of the mysterious wind. Why aren't you lying with your beheaded husband? The voice slowly became a person right in front of her eyes. His head evolved from the air into a man not from this earth. He wore a large black hood that covered his whole body. He floated above the floor by several inches. When he smiled, his sinister teeth caught the glimmer of the moon. Susie stepped a few inches back, feeling a pain on her head. She didn't whimper though. Her fear took over, making her almost paralyzed. The man's hand, long and disfigured, came pointing towards the door of her and her husband's bedroom. With all of her strength, she looked towards the doorway. She didn't see anything until she felt something hit her head and her eyes closed. Two months later, their daughter came into the house. She had brought along her boyfriend. You never told me what happened to your parents, he said smiling and holding her hand. She smiled, but it was an empty one. She looked down, not sure what to say. They died over two months ago. It was a big tragedy. Apparently their house was robbed and they got caught in a robbery gone wrong. Her voice twinkled with sadness. He nodded in sympathy, not saying another word about it. She knew what she told him was a lie. But how could she tell him that her parents left the house and had gone somewhere, not even telling anyone where? To top it off, the house was completely destroyed after their leaving. She sighed in regret, lying to her boyfriend like this. They entered the house side by side. All the furniture was there, but the walls were bare. You go on ahead, I'll wait here for the U-Haul truck with our stuff in it. That's right, she thought. They had brought beds and tons of boxes. She nodded and headed towards the darkness that filled the once happy home. She walked through the hallway, imagining what happened the night they decided to leave. What could have caused them to? As she was walking along the corridor, remembering all the good times she'd had as a child, things began to look different to her. Stopping, she squinted at the wall. She gasped and tried finding a reasonable answer. Although nothing could hide the fact that it was indeed scratch marks along the side of the wall. Cats? Someone running with scissors? Vandalism? Rational explanations kept flooding her mind. It's such an old place. Maybe it's vandalism. Kids must have picked the lock, snuck in, and used a knife or scissors to scratch up the walls. She thought aloud, smiling to herself. Nothing to worry about then, she added inside her head. Next, she headed towards her mother and father's room. With a hint of sadness and doubt, she opened the door to find nothing or no one in the room. Before now, she'd opened this door millions of times, seeing them smiling at her and feeling the love run through her body. Now, 
all that runs through her body is the sadness of never seeing her parents again. Hey, Chels, it's here. Brad called her from the front door. She immediately shook the daydream away, but couldn't help to feel that something had been there with her. Following her boyfriend's call, she was confronted with two other men taking down the boxes and the bed. Hours later, the truck had been emptied. They thanked the two men for their hard work and paid them $20 each. Upon unpacking the boxes, there was one marked with a strange symbol. What is it, Brad? She said, noticing that he was motioning for her to come where he was. What's this? He asked, sounding excited. She shrugged as she examined the mysterious mark. It looks to me like an ancient symbol or something. He looked at her with wondering eyes that said he wanted to open this thing. She looked at him and said, If you're thinking about opening this thing, then forget it. It looks weird and evil. I don't want to unleash some demon thing or the devil. He laughed as soon as she finished. He rested his hand on her shoulder and said, But don't we live on Devil Street? She gave him a sarcastic look and continued with her packing. Later on in the evening, she'd fallen asleep. Brad looked at the unopened strange box that carried the mysterious symbol with curious eyes. If Chelsea's asleep, then it'll be perfect because she won't know, right? He thought as he grinned to himself. He grabbed the box and headed to their used to be Chelsea's parents' bedroom, but now it's their bedroom. He closed the door gently, and without a second thought of regret, he opened the box to find a simple laptop. It must be Chelsea's old laptop, he thought as he held it in his hands. He could feel something trickle down his spine, not enough to cause hysteria though, but enough for him to shiver from the cold. He looked to see the window and thought maybe there might be an opening in it. He opened the laptop and the last thing he saw before he faded to black was the Google homepage. It must have been midnight since it was still dark when Chelsea opened her eyes to hear a faint buzzing sound. My phone? She said surprised but worried if someone was calling her. She checked her pocket, but it wasn't coming from her phone. Well, it's got to be Brad, she thought, as she held the wall in the pitch black hallway. Brad! Brad! She called in a semi-scream, semi-whisper tone. Suddenly, the buzzing stopped. She sighed and headed to the bedroom to sleep on a real bed. She awoke in the morning to find she was alone in the house. Maybe he went to the store, she thought, as she got dressed and made breakfast. She ate her meal and thought about the buzzing sound again. She assumed it was Brad's phone, but he never puts it on vibrate. It suddenly slipped out of her mind as she was faced with more unpacking. She was in the middle of putting away dishes when she heard a slight sound. It was like a high-pitched breathing, only low and drawn out. She looked around the corner, but every time she did, it would stop. She soon figured it was nothing to worry about. Later that night, as she was getting ready for bed, she heard it again. This time, it was much, much lower. She looked around the room to find nothing strange or anything that could make that noise. She continued to comb her hair, ignoring everything. Suddenly, she realized something was missing. Her boyfriend. He hadn't come back since he left this morning. She also realized that she hadn't even seen him leave. She called the police, but they said that they couldn't do anything until the next day. She nodded and thanked them. She hardly slept through the night, playing scenarios of what could have happened to him. In the middle of those thoughts, she had fallen asleep only to wake up to the same buzzing noise. She got up and listened closely. It couldn't have been the neighbors because they weren't around. 
It couldn't have been a cell phone because she turned hers off. She wondered if it was the alarm clock she would recently bought. She unplugged it and the buzzing stopped. She was relieved it was only the alarm clock and she fell back to sleep. Later, around 3 a.m., she was awakened by the same buzzing sound. She got up and looked at the alarm clock. It was off. But where was the sound coming from? She got up and checked the whole room to find nothing. There was a thump. She immediately turned around. Upon closer examination, she saw a laptop. Maybe it's Brad's, she thought aloud, trying to reassure herself. She reached slowly for it, and suddenly there was pain along her arm. It burned, and she got her arm back to find a large scratch. It could have been from a nail on the floor. She eventually got hold of the laptop and put it on her desk, but she was very tired and fell asleep, waiting until morning to check that thing out. As soon as she got dressed, she sat at the chair next to her desk. Opening the laptop, it didn't seem different, other than it not having any brand symbols. The only symbol on it was the one in the lower hand corner, the same one that was on the box. Then she thought back about Brad wanting to open that box. The laptop came to life and showed a normal Windows screen. There were two accounts on this laptop. The first one was called First of All, the second titled Secondly. She decided to click on the first one. It opened up and nothing seemed to be odd, unless you count no programs and a plain black desktop background odd. She finally found a text document. She opened it and read aloud, hoping it would calm her nerves. First of all, I'd like to thank you for purchasing this laptop. It means so much to me that you'd go out of your way for the person you hate. As one of the nine satanic statements say, he represents vengeance instead of turning the other cheek. Now, let me explain what will happen to the person you despise, much like a voodoo doll, but the total opposite. You give them this or hide it for them to find. Once they open it, they will be sent to hell for all eternity. You have exactly five days to cast the spell. She stopped reading. Sadness filled her stomach, knowing someone had hated him. And then, she felt something tickle her spine and grew to become something sharp. She felt the pain in her lower back sharpening until she became numb. Don't worry, my dear. A low, calm voice flushed over her. You'll be all right soon. The wall spun out of control as her eyes fluttered and stayed shut. The police were soon called by a friend who visited them and hadn't heard any signs for the past five days. They barged in and saw nothing and no one. The walls were naked without any decoration. The rooms, each one, hollow without any furniture. The only thing that remained was a simple laptop in the middle of the master bedroom. The policeman examined the laptop and found a text document was opened. No words were written down. He logged off, but before shutting down, he logged into the one titled, Secondly. Curiosity got the better of him, and he was confronted with a nice family portrait. An elderly couple, with a young lady holding a young man's hand. A text document suddenly appeared. It was titled, Whom You Wish to Curse. Text. It read simply, The Newton Family. <laughs>